I will uh, get back to the welcome in a few minutes, but uh, just opening up by uh, noting that uh, we here at UBC are at Coast Sally's territory. And uh, we acknowledge that we are at the tra traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people, the Tlaiwatut people and the Squamish people. Also, um, I would uh, like to remind you once again that the recordings are available at the Echo Park YouTube channel and at the Facebook page and also that you can find the lectures, the tutorials, the assignments at the course website. Uh, you'll see, you can see the uh, link to it here, so uh, you have access to this. We also have a Slack workspace uh, where there's been quite a bit of discussion going on and there's more information. And if you don't have access to a Slack workspace, uh, do feel free to send me an email and I will get you uh, linked into that. And that brings us to today where we are have a whole a special treat in the form of we have two lectures. First it's uh, Kim de Mutsitz, who is now with University of Southern Mississippi and who's been uh, working on ecosystem modeling and the effects on environmental and anthropogenic stresses for a number of years, including quite a bit of work related to the Mississippi. And uh, you'll hear more about that in her presentation. She's also strongly involved in developing the spatial uh, temporal analysis in EWE and uh, as such a uh, treasured cooperator. The second speaker who uh, is Vatsu Capucci, who is uh, a former student at, at the Fishery Center at UBC and has been working with us also for a long time. Uh, she now works for a consultancy group called Hamira, which is uh, one of the leading uh, consultancy groups here in, uh, in Western Canada. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Vatsu for, for years now on the Roberts Bank Terminal the environmental impact assessment and uh, I can tell you she was a credible star in the um, panel hearings that we had in, in the way that she was handling questions and, uh, and with her knowledge. And I can say all this because she's, uh, she's not here right now, she's joining us in, in 20 minutes, so uh, flat is okay, right? That's about it for the introduction. I will stop sharing and, uh, and hand it over to you. Please, welcome. All right. Well, thanks, Vili, and thank you all for, uh, for joining me today. Um, I'll be talking about uh, a use of an eco-space model uh, in uh, trade-offs in coastal management. And you'll learn more in my presentation about these planned diversions to restore uh, the coast. Well, first off, I'm uh, in southern Mississippi um, and Ocean Springs, and I'm actually on the traditional territory of the uh, Biloxi people. I'm, I'm right down here on the coast. So what I'll be talking about uh, today is an application of an ecospace model. And uh, we've held a workshop with uh, scientists in the Gulf of Mexico when it was clear that uh, uh, just with the technology we have so far, we are really ready to apply these models. Uh, but what would be really the areas where they could be applied in? And I think you've heard more about ecosystem-based management of fisheries, so that's definitely one area. But another one that's really uh, ripe for taking up ecosystem models is ecosystem restoration. And what you see here in an example is, is, is a restoration project where they're building land, so that will be very relevant for uh, my presentation to come. So my research area is uh, Louisiana. What you're looking at here is the Mississippi River, uh, Louisiana wetlands. The red here shows you 
land that's either lost or is projected to be lost by 2050 if no coastal restoration projects will take place. So these areas, they're not uh, highly populated. What you see here is, the, is New Orleans, so that is the populated city. These areas, though, are, uh, are wetlands, um, but they're still very important. The, ecos the ecosystem services of these uh, areas are, are, are really uh, numerous. And um, uh, basically by uh, having the Mississippi River, River levied off, the natural way these wetlands uh, remain there through nourishment of fresh water and nutrients and sediments from the river, uh, was really taken away. So these wetlands, the reason that they're disappearing is because they're sinking. So there's, of course, sea level rise, but also just a natural sinking of lands uh, and, and not being replenished with new nutrients and sediments to keep up with that. Uh, so part of the restoration project amongst uh, several projects in the larger Louisiana Coastal Master Plan is to reintroduce this river water in these areas by openings in the Mississippi River. So these would be controlled openings. So a little bit more about the services. Uh, so again, there, people do live here, uh, but it's not highly populated. But it's highly used, for example, for recreational purposes, uh, not only by Louisianians, but people that come um, out of states to Louisiana to, uh, uh, to fish here. Also, uh, commercial uh, fishing. Uh, there's a very uh, rich and valuable fishery in, in Louisiana. So for the Coastal Master Plan, they've, they've uh, done an analysis of what is really the value of this land. And uh, just to point a few out uh, that, that we're uh, dealing with is that Louisiana is the second highest commercial fishing landings in the United States. And even though uh, a lot of this fishing occurs offshore, uh, the... Um, um, wetlands are really used by the juveniles of species. So 75% of Louisiana's commercial fin and shellfish species depend on wetlands for spawning, nursery habitat, and feeding. Now, there's very various other services that these wetlands provide, and they added it up here. And really, uh, the natural capital of these wetlands is $1.3 uh, trillion U.S. dollars. So in short, uh, worth saving uh, as a, uh, I would say, side project to the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan, the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority got together to start this uh, Mississippi River Delta Management Study, uh, where uh, the focus is really on the Mississippi River Delta, and the projects included um, using models uh, to look at how these freshwater diversions that I mentioned, these openings in the Mississippi River, letting river water back into the wetlands, uh, how they would uh, build lands, how they would build uh, wetlands. So this project was underway. And at some point, uh, I was brought in, I was already involved in the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan, but I was brought into this project to look at what then if we were to let this fresh water back in, which is obviously needed to rebuild the wetlands, would that do to the fish and fisheries in this area? So this area is already not used to uh, this freshwater inflow for a long time. So what we're used to now, where fish occur, where we can fish, uh, will change because of that. So what is the trade-off exactly if we, if we would do these things? So here, an, uh, just an extra diagram of, of what you want to think of when I talk about a river diversion. 
So here you see this is schematic, so there's not one planned here. You see the Mississippi River again. You see also in this picture this odd shape. We call this the bird foot uh, for obvious reasons. So the the water naturally really chooses the quickest way uh, to the sea. And you can already see how unnatural it is, how far uh, uh, this, this bird food sticks out. And that's because of this levee system. The water has nowhere to go. So then if you create an opening and the water can come out there, that's when with the sediments and, and nutrients that come with the water, wetlands can be built again. So you want to do these in shallow areas so you don't just lose all the sediments and nutrients, which is what's happening right now. So the bird food is so far out in the Gulf of Mexico that it gets pretty deep uh, pretty quickly uh, uh, from there. So the sediments uh, are really getting lost in the open water. So if you were to do something like this, you can actually make use of those sediments and, and build wetlands again. Um, so this, uh, this question I was uh, basically asked to answer with my, with my project, how do a select combination of sediment diversions affect the fish and shellfish in the receiving basins? Uh, so to do this, um, I propose to develop an ecosystem model that accounts for the environmental changes in these basins, but also includes fishing and predator-prey interactions. So you can imagine that Ecospace was uh, just perfect for that. And then to get at those environmental changes, uh, we decided to couple the model to the models in place to look at the land building. And for this project, that was a Delft 3D hydrodynamic model. And they've already uh, worked on other components to the model than just looking at uh, sediment distribution. So there was a biological model coupled to, coupled to it already. So there were various, very useful environmental drivers we could use as inputs that were outputs from that model. And we use chlorophyll A, salinity, temperature, percent wetland cover. So that was the land building aspect that we could incorporate in our model uh, and the total suspended solids in the water. So again, uh, EcoPath with EcoSim and EcoSpace was used. So even when you build an EcoSpace model, you always build an EcoPath model first. So that was really the snapshot of the ecosystem, the initial conditions of the model. Uh, we still use EcoSim as well to calibrate uh, the model. There's a lot of um, surveys in the area. So we had a lot of data to look at uh, over time uh, to look at uh, fish biomass and see if our model did a good job and calibrate it to those data. And then EcoSpace was really the framework of the model. So here you see the model area. Uh, some things you'll see in here, these uh, colorful circles are the locations of the proposed uh, river diversions. So in this project, we looked at four. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, Breton Sound, this is Barataria Bay. In both basins, two uh, large diversions were tested, letting water into Barataria Bay on this side, Breton Sound on this side. The model area is really the whole square, uh, but uh, this model was co-developed with managers that had specific interest in getting output for, for regions. And you can do that in Ecospace. So uh, with the information from the managers, we created these regions in the model uh, so that uh, our output would already uh, right away uh, give, uh, you know, an average biomass of, of a particular region, which was useful for this project. These are the groups in the model. Uh, all of these had um, life stages. So this is a multi-stanza model. Uh, you can see it's a long list. This too was developed uh, together with managers, uh, which I've realized makes the list longer because uh, they have a lot of species they would like to know uh, things about. And, and one piece of advice would be to be really clear which of these species you can really uh, say something about or if they're just in there to be a predator to another species that you're important, but it's really pretty data poor. 
And so we have both of those uh, types of species in the model. And for my output, I actually will only focus on a few that were really of high interest. Um, so Gulf Menhaden is really the largest fishery in uh, the Gulf of Mexico by weight. Uh, largemouth bass is a, a popular recreational uh, sport fish. Red drum, uh, spotted sea trout, same thing. And blue crab and brown shrimp uh, are uh, important commercially uh, again. So here you see a, uh, a clear diagram of the, of the model setup. Uh, you can see there's a lot of moving parts here, which are hard to uh, uh, understand in this one slide. So let me walk you through it. Um, so we started with a Delft 3D model that simulates uh, the sediment diversion operation plan. So an operation plan would be, you know, what if we open it for, uh, you know, four of them for four months or uh, two of them for three months? What, what happens uh, with and, and the main output from this model is the land gain. So here you see an example of when you let water into an area these deltas start to form. So that's really what the main purpose of that model is. But again, um, they had um, uh, other uh, output as well that was very useful to the ecospace model. Um, and uh, we were able to, uh, there's actually uh, a lot of output out of a Delft 3D model. It can function on an hourly basis. For Ecospace, we were interested in monthly output. So we averaged uh, these drivers monthly and used monthly maps. So we're, yeah, you know, in space of chlorophyll A, temperature, salinity, and total suspended solids. Now, not for all biological life, um, the monthly maps were a high enough re resolution to really know what would happen to the species. So oysters, for example, which is another important commercial species in this area, would already be uh, affected by um, uh, 20 days or less of fresh water coming into uh, to this area. So we may not pick that up on an average of the month if the other days of the month have perhaps very high salinity and it may not become below the threshold of what really affects these oysters. So we had a, a added another modeler that created um, these, uh, what we called... Um, uh, oyster environmental capacity layers really uh, modeled after the uh, habitat capacity model in ecospace. Um, <clears throat> and with daily output from the Delft 3D model um, and, and different response curves, uh, layers were, were created that uh, looked at, well, what if the daily changes in these drivers are, are such, the oysters response in this way, what is the habitat capacity for oysters? So then directly these capacity maps were included monthly in the ecospace model uh, after this little subroutine. Also, oysters only uh, settle on some hard uh, substrates. So we also included a culch map. Culch is a word for uh, oyster shells, rubble that oysters use to, to settle on. And then the land gain itself was an important driver because just the wetland area or wetland edge is, is an important factor in um, uh, juvenile uh, species. So that uh, we included annually just because there was uh you know small changes monthly so annual maps were included um to um represent the land change with these diversions and then uh, this output uh and i say fish biomass here but just any of the groups in the model we looked at biomass distribution and landings of all the groups in the model and for landings of course the uh, commercially harvested groups So how do the species in the model uh, respond to the environmental conditions that are given to them every month uh, through these, um, uh, these, these driver maps? 
Uh, and that really happens in the habitat capacity model. So that's uh, a paper of, of, of Philly 2014. Uh, so what you're looking at here are environmental preference functions. So if we look at number two, for example, you can imagine that if uh, so salinity was an important factor in our model, that there's some type of optimum salinity for each of the groups or species in your model, and that it becomes less optimal with lower and higher salinity. That translates then to habitat uh, capacity in the model. You can include all these different drivers. So we had more than one uh, parameter that uh, determines uh, the environmental conditions each species would be in in each cell. So with the habitat capacity model, you can then look at, well, together, how does that translate in capacity? So it's really a type of habitat suitability. So you also, at, before you really start your trophic interactions, Ecospace will combine for you your environmental drivers maps with your response curves to create these habitat capacity maps. And what I show in this example here is, is the high affinity of juvenile brown shrimp for uh, marsh edge. So you really see them trailing uh, those edges in the, in the habitat capacity map. And then, of course, everything else happens. There's fishing, there's uh, trophic interactions. So this is one component of uh, how much biomass you would expect at the end of your run in each cell. Then the operation plan I'll be showing you, and for this project, we tested several. Uh, for this one, though, um, we're opening all four of the diversions. So I've, I've included that little uh, map here that you remember what that is. Um, and uh, what triggered the opening in this particular scenario was what you see here in the dotted line is the um, <clears throat> the amount of water, so the discharge uh, of the Mississippi River. And uh, with 600,000 CFS uh, discharge in the river, that would trigger the opening of all four diversions that then would let these uh, amounts of water through. And you can see you know, they're on two different scales. The Mississippi River is here. The diversions are here. Uh, so, yeah, there's enough water to make all four of these have these amounts of water uh, go through uh, when the Mississippi River is at uh, 600,000 uh, CFS. What you see here, uh, this is mostly interesting from people in this area. There's already two diversions operational. And I actually worked on um, one for my dissertation as a student. And just the sheer difference in scale of these newly planned uh, diversions are really obvious here because these are the operational plans for the existing diversions. All right, let's talk about results. And I'll highlight uh, one species with maps here. And again, I, I, this is a multi-stanza model. So these are the juvenile Gulf Menhaden. Uh, the model was run for 50 years. Uh, FWOA is a future without action. And in June of year 50, and if you remember the operational plan, uh, that would be right when the species had a long time of fresh water coming in. So they would be at that time mostly affected uh, by the diversions. So of course, with the future without action, there are no diversions. This is what the distribution looks like. This is what the distribution looks like with the opening of the diversions uh, in June. So you see kind of a clearing of the species here. Again, there's several environmental drivers in there. So I started looking into it, assuming you know, the salinity would really uh, be the one doing this, but juvenile Gulf Menhaden are actually uh, have, a, have a pretty wide tolerance range for, for uh, lower salinities. And it turned out that the main driver was really the lowered um, concentrations of chlorophyll A because of the total suspended solids that came in the water. So that just the uh, uh, the lowered light conditions resulting in less phytoplankton ended up being the main reason of the reduction here. So um, this is was for me another warning, like we drive uh, primary product 
creativity in, in uh, ecospace often with using the nutrients directly. So having chlorophyll A in the model and having those nuances where nitrogen doesn't immediately result in chlorophyll A, there's some, you know, interaction with light as well, uh, really showed me that that's an important aspect uh, to include. Then in October in a future without action, this is what the distribution looked like. And I'm showing October because that's when they're uh, basically conditions pretty much return to uh, uh, not having uh, fresh water inflow. It's been long enough closed. Uh, and this is then October in uh, the uh, scenario with the diversions open. And you do see that uh, it's not exactly the same, but there's a high level of recovery. So the um, uh, fish just return to the areas when they are um, um, uh, suitable for them uh, again. So uh, I'll not show you uh, a lot more maps. Uh, what I also did was looking at the relative change. So relative to a future without action by opening these diversions and I'll at the little map again for uh, for reference of these species that I, I pointed out are, are specifically uh, of interest uh, to the stakeholders. Um, so what is obvious here, I would say, is that the uh, middle Barrett area and middle Breton, um, the difference to a future without action from a, an, an, an scenario with a diversion open, is really uh, resulting in the most relative change. So um, there's less uh, brown shrimp in these areas, uh, red drum, Gulf Menhaden. Of course, lar largemouth bass really likes the fresh water. So we see uh, uh, pretty high increases of largemouth bass uh, by opening these diversions. But the rest of the species, and obviously right now, most of the species there like higher salinities because that's what the conditions are right now, um, see a reduction. And, and what I just pointed out with my example, too, is not just salinity, also changes in uh, chlorophyll A. In some areas, it's actually higher because there's nutrient inflow. But in some areas, it, it is lower because of the TSS, so the amount of, of uh, sediments in the water would actually reduce phytoplankton growth in some, uh, some areas. Now, um, if you look at the black bar, that is model-wide. So if you remember, that's actually the whole square. So not only um, are uh, the areas outside these focus areas uh, you know, so much less affected that the model white area doesn't, over the most part, show as much change as these regional areas. Also, um, keep in mind that this is a relative change. So, and I can tell you that these middle areas, really pretty high up in the estuaries, weren't the best habitat with the highest biomass of species like uh uh, brown shrimp and 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 uh, and Gulf Menhaden. Uh, anyways, they're more in the in these lower areas. So the relative change may be high, but the total biomass change is actually not as much as in the lower Barrett area and lower Breton area, which uh, for a, a large part explains why, since that change is less, the uh, the difference is dampened on a model wide area. Now, if we look at catch, it's even a bit starker. So there's a lot less to be caught in these uh, middle Barrett area, middle Breton area. So, you know, going ahead with this plan, this can also serve as a, uh, a, a warning or a way to prepare that these will not be good fishing grounds uh, for these species anymore. And uh, there's no um, commercial fishing for uh, largemouth bass, so that's uh, not in this picture, but others uh, are. So uh, oysters, for example, are here. Black drum is here uh, that there is a fishery for. And again, you see, even though there's big changes in some areas, that over the overall and the entire model area, these responses are, are dampened. 
So in summary, there's a decrease uh, in species that prefer the higher salinities. And of course, the way the conditions are right now, those are most of them. And then increases in the few species that prefer lower salinities. The magnitude of change is dampened on a larger spatial scale. So there's also redistribution of species. So Perhaps if the plan uh, of the operational plan leaves areas that are suitable, then there is at least space for species to go to. These are all uh, nectonic, uh, except for the oysters. So they can actually move and ecospace will replicate uh, or represent that. Also, uh, you know, be mindful of when you look at relative changes, how, mis- how much does it change from what it is if there's no divergence are not necessarily the areas where there was the highest amount of biomass to begin with. And in this case, a large relative change in areas with low biomass, uh, you know, didn't really contribute as much to the total biomass change. Because those lower areas had most of the biomass, the two lower diversions actually were mostly responsible for the total biomass change when we ran other operation plans with only some of the diversions open, for example. So uh, what is the application of this? Um, So, uh, of course, we were only one model in a suite of models where also the land building was not as um, as beneficial in these lower diversions. So, again, thinking of trade offs. the focus ended up being on the two upper diversions, the mid Baratheria and the mid Breton diversions, and the lower diversions are put on hold and are, are probably never going to be uh, developed. Um, there is, of course, uh, changes because of those upper diversions as well. You saw the reduction in, in catch and biomass, but in this case, the land building capacity, the benefits from that of the upper diversions really outweigh the biomass losses. Uh, and again, there's a lot of areas where they're still, uh, um, uh, that are still suitable for these species that they can move to. Um, so uh, what we can uh, help with further, so if that uh, idea of, well, let's go for the upper diversions, even though there are some negative effects, uh, the output can help prepare for change. So it will still affect some people that happen to be fishing high up in the estuary. So as long as you know in advance or maybe even be helped with uh, making a move to a lower estuary, uh, you know, the losses will be uh, will be less. So before, of course, uh, you know, as scientists and managers, you can be all in favor of something. You also need the political will. And that really happened at the same time of, as well. So um, uh, Governor John Bell Edwards of Louisiana declared a state of emergency to, for the Louisiana coast because of the uh, disappearing of wetlands. Uh, And he said the Louisiana coast is in a state of crisis that demands immediate and urgent action to avert further damage to one of our most vital resources. Now, with this declaration, a lot more became possible. And in the same year, the mid Baratheria sediment diversion uh, was granted fast track uh, permitting. Um, so, um, so really what the science resulted in was uh, the managers being allowed to start the permitting process. The permitting process itself still includes an environmental impact statement. Uh, we were actually asked back uh, to do uh, some follow-up research uh, as part of the environmental impact statement. And for this, uh, they attracted uh, multiple modelers and uh, an advisory panel and interestingly asked us to um, move back a little bit, go to EcoPath and and look at uh, the ecosystem structure of of the system under different uh, uh, salinity regimes and, and calculate some ecological indices that uh, tell us something about the, uh, the resilience of the system. Uh, so quite a different project in the end was used in the environmental impact statement than the project that led up to that. And we actually uh, published that last week. So that's another interesting uh, follow-up study for you to, uh, to look into. 
So with that, uh, I would like to thank my uh, funders, uh, those providing data, uh, the managers. Uh, this model was really co-developed. Uh, we had a lot of meetings and there was a lot of input of, of what they wanted us to include, uh, which ended up improving the model. Uh, I want to thank my collaborators and, and co-authors, uh, Christy Lewis, Scott Milroy, uh, Joe Busowski and Jeroen Steinbeek. And uh, you saw some pretty photographs in this presentations that are uh, taken by a local photographer. Uh, that's uh, Hunter Gindry. And if you're interested to learn more about this, you can aim your camera to this QR code and, and, and download the paper that way. And I thank you all uh, for listening and I'll take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Kim, for an impressive overview. And... Uh... We have a few questions. I suggest we uh, we take a round of questions now, uh, then we go back to uh, and continue with Vasu's presentation and have more questions after that, including also two uh, brief presentations related to the topic of today, which is environmental impact statements and assessments. Uh, Shaya, you uh, had a question. Do you want to start off with that? Okay, just a simple one. You were, the output of uh, Delphit is the chlorophyll A, and you had to translate it into uh, phytoplankton biomass? Well, I wouldn't say translate. So right now what you can do in EcoSpace, you can use a primary uh, productivity driver. So you have your phytoplankton biomass in your model as part of your EcoPath model, right? So you can, with uh, basically the relative changes of your phytoplankton can be uh, changed by your primary productivity driver. So for that, you can use nutrients, for example. So if the nutrients increase, your phytoplankton biomass in your model increases. But if you were to use uh, chlorophyll A, so you're really using it in the same way that you would use nitrogen, you then also account for the fact that not every unit of nutrients uh, turn into, you know, a unit of phytoplankton. So you have just a little bit more of a nuanced representation of, of uh, primary productivity drivers, but you don't, you know, directly translate chlorophyll A phytoplankton. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. And uh, Spencer, you, you go next. I had a very similar question, actually. We, we asked our question, um, me and Cesar, at the same time. <clears throat> but um, I was wondering, um, so you spoke a little bit about phytoplankton. So when you, uh, how did you also look at uh, submerged aquatic vegetation changes in, in uh, production for that? Because um, I, was, I was wondering, like, uh, if there's an increase in nutrients, does that only translate to, um, and of course, more TSS, does that only translate to changes to phytoplankton, or how did that also change other um, uh, other vegetation? Right, right. So yeah, you can um, you can actually choose if you include a driver uh, whether it which primary productivity groups it affects. Um, so we ended up seeing the chlorophyll A as a proxy for how much uh, you know primary productivity can occur. So we did also uh, drive the SAV with that, uh, that change, uh, and, and thereby, because um, uh, we didn't have good relationships, uh, we really put uh, total suspended solids in there as a driver on SAV. So in this way, we also reflected in the model what already happened in the other model with chlorophyll A, you know, would decrease because there just wouldn't be enough light. We could see that in, uh, you know, that would affect us as well. So by using that as a driver, we, uh, you know, we could reflect those, uh, those processes as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And Alexis, you had a couple of questions. Hi there. Yes, I have two questions. Um, I believe you answered my first one, so I might change the wording a little bit. But um, was agriculture runoff considered or was it sounding like chlorophyll A maybe was the pro 
the best close proxy for determining nitrogen. Right. And, but yeah, the, the nutrients pretty much come from agricultural runoff. Um, but yeah, in, in, instead of us grabbing the nutrients directly, we let, um, you know, the phytoplankton model coupled to the uh, Delft 3D model uh, turn it into primary productivity or primary production, which first is chlorophyll first. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much uh, where all the nutrients uh, come from. We did not include oxygen. That was pretty much, um, you know, a lot of these decisions are not as much our decisions as what um, drivers come out of the other models. In this particular case, these are really shallow basins and uh, with measurements um, was determined that the, uh, uh, the mixing is so strong there that uh, there is really no hypoxia in those uh, areas. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't included as an output in the Delft 3D model. Um, so as soon as you start going outside of these estuaries, it does actually play a role. And I have other models that are more offshore that actually at hypoxia. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't an output we could use. And, and it was... Uh, you know, pretty well reasons that in the areas where we were looking at uh, hypoxia formation. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, thank you. Okay, my second question was the regions. Um, I'm curious to know how they were defined by the managers, if that was driven by the location of the diversions or if it was more the location of the species that were of focus. I think these are management regions, so they had nothing really to do with our model. So they would, would just be interested in specific, the output in specific spatial units that they are responsible for. So, uh, so yeah, definitely not based on uh, factors in our model. Okay. So less ecological and more. It may be uh, it may be somewhat ecological. So the managers, of course, are also biologists, but nothing related to what we uh, were doing. Uh, so the managing units that they okay, great, wonderful, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Alexis and Holton. Hi, Kim. Nice to meet you. Um, I work with Dave Shigeris, and we're starting a project on the Suwannee River estuary, um, linking a hydrodynamic model to the an eco space model we're developing. So I've been studying your work for a while, uh, so I really appreciate it. It's really helpful uh, for us. So I'll probably follow up with you. Maybe I could ask you questions for hours. Uh, but following this, I just wanted to ask kind of two questions specifically about oysters, which is something I've been trying to think through a lot of how you um, really try to include oysters into a model like this, which is both a habitat and a fishery um, and a species um, a part of the model. So I wanted to ask if you could explain the environmental capacity uh, layer a little bit more. I wasn't Still left a little unclear of whether or not it was like an R script or a plugin for a GIS layer. Um, and then also it might be, might answer this in here. Um, how you, if you included oysters as habitat um, into the model and whether or not you included like the filter feeding effects of oysters and the effects on suspended solids or like the effects of the changing habitat of the fisheries. Right. That's a lot of questions. Uh, let me <laughs> back. <laughs> so, um, so there's no feedback in our model. Uh, so that kind of gets to your like filtering uh, capacity and whatnot. So uh, I think in some cases that may be useful. It's, it's for sure will be a, a, a quite a different project if you need to do that so that you basically say, you know, going back to the Delft 3D model and say, well, no, actually your TSS is different, your chlorophyll A is different. Uh, we did not. So this is a one unidirectional model. We grab the output and, and it goes uh, 
to us. So we're really the end uh, station um, without feedback. So, so yeah, that would be interesting uh, to work on. So we'll, we'll, uh, I'll follow your work as well when you, uh, when you pursue that. Um, let's see the other questions for Habitat. Um, we of course had the Colch maps where the um, uh, oysters would grow on. So, I would say, uh, I, first of all, I can say we did not do that. We did not include uh, cults as a factor on other species than the oysters. But if you're interested in doing that, that may be an easy way. Because basically with the cults maps, your oysters will grow there. So, mm-hmm. and you could use the same cults map to say, well, I actually want to include um Uh, you know, oyster beds as a habitat driver, that may be a very easy way to get at that. And a hard way, of course, would be then, you know, feedback in your oyster growth uh, and, and, and make it a dynamic driver in, in some way. But I would say the culture map would be a good way uh, to get at that and, and just ways how your other species are affected by your, your culture map as well. That's, that's um, like a special layer. What was that? As like a spatial layer. Yeah, you can just have a stationary habitat layer. And for example, what we did with the marsh uh, uh, growth, even if it's a, it's not stationary, if you load in a new one per, uh, per time step. So with that one, for example, since the land was growing with the diversions, we put a new one in um, every year. So, uh, so you can also decide to do that, you know, pick a time when you think it will change. So you could still, um, yeah, you could still include a changing, uh, cult map or, or oyster, uh, uh, reef map as well by just loading a new one uh, at, at different times in your model. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Let's see, the oyster um, environmental capacity layer. So uh, what we did, um, this was a habitat suitability model, I would say, outside of ecospace. So uh, what it would do is just the same as ecospace. It would have response curves of oysters to environmental drivers, but then the capacity was determined per day. So every day the oysters would get the output of the environmental drivers and with the response curves, the capacity was determined. Now, in the end, you will still average your capacities to get to a monthly layer. So then you immediately have your capacity map, so you don't calculate your capacity map anymore. But still, the average of capacities is, for example, for 21 days, your capacity was zero because the salinity was so low, they can't survive it. And then a few days, it is actually, you know, maybe your capacity comes up to 0.6 or who knows what. Your average will still much more reflect that you had a long time during your month that the habitat was not suitable, much more so than if you were to average your low salinity with maybe a very high salinity for a couple of days and just kind of bring the salinity up to a level that is suitable for the oysters. And you didn't even notice in your model that they were unhappy for three weeks. So you basically do the exact same thing as the uh, habitat capacity model, but then on a daily basis, then you average your capacities and, and, and uh, feed in Uh, just like the other layer, so it's an ASCII uh, map of your uh, capa- oyster capacity. That's an average of your. I think so you're able to capture the extremes rather than just take the averages. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Kim, I have to ask here did you run that daily model for 50 years as well? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Did you discuss uh, with Jerome and Joe uh, why they, uh, if they would make it possible for you, since it's the same, very similar model, I, I can see it would be faster to run that model on its own. Uh, but the spatial, one thing we've been discussing is the temporal spatial framework is now set up to run or to read in on a monthly basis 
only. Um, we have had discussions about why is it only a month? Why couldn't it be any time step? Because Echo Space can run with any time step. Um, did you have that kind of discussions with Joan and Joe? We didn't really talk about it. It was a small enough project that it wasn't, uh, we didn't really need the automation. And it also wasn't very handy, I would think, that we didn't need it for all the species. So uh, that could be a decision, of course, to do it for all the species on a daily basis. Um, um, so yeah, your model will run longer. Uh, I guess you know, getting a bigger computer will be uh, part of that. But um, and to, to solve that issue, um, but yeah, we didn't. Uh, we didn't really uh, specifically look into how can we automate this. Uh, of course, the Delft 3D did its own thing at another time. So to truly have everything running, it would have taken a lot longer. But uh, instead of uh, us averaging the output over a month in this, for these particular drivers for the oysters, we just wanted the daily output. So we started from there and started running and really just these, uh, you know, habitat suitability models, just creating these daily capacity layers, it doesn't, it doesn't take uh, very long at all. And I imagine actually it wouldn't take that long if it is incorporated in eco space. But in the end, just like grab this one, grab that one. Uh, on my computer, I think the model already took 14 hours or so. <laughs> so you yeah. would, uh, eventually, oh, you know. You know, this would, this would be much worse, but it is an issue we run into a number of times. And uh, one, one possibility here, which probably would make uh, Jerome uh, uh, scream, uh, in Echo Tracer, Will has set it up so that Echo Tracer can run many time steps within uh, the other model, the bigger EWE model that runs on a monthly time step. So it's it's a nested within it. But it is it's a question we need to continue to discuss. Um, I don't see any other, more questions, but I do want to make a, a just just one thing which there are some numbers that really impressed me on on the Mississippi relating to how much the sedimentation has changed. I don't think you mentioned that. No. Yeah, that's true. So, um, or maybe you had more that you want to finish? No, first. that was the first. Yeah, no, exactly. So there is, of course, uh, so the, the narrative is this whole uh, wetland area was built with the sediments coming from the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River changes its course. That's how all this land got deposited. Let's go back to this natural process by creating these diversions and all the land will be deposited again. Uh, there are a lot of dams in the Mississippi River watershed. If you look at a map of the United States and, and overlay the Mississippi River watershed, it's almost the entire country. So there's a lot of, of areas where, you know, people do their own thing with the water. And apparently a lot of that is dams and, and other uses of water. So right now, the amount of uh, sediment in the um, Mississippi River is a lot less than what it used to be. So uh, these diversions are going to be less efficient than if they were built, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago. Uh, but the, um, the sediment modelers and hydrodynamic modelers uh, are aware of this and they do work with, you know, uh, nowadays uh, sediment loads in the river uh, and so that is incorporated in the amount of land building. You know, what are the possible available sediments if we were to do this? Uh, and uh, there's a bit of a debate, like how much, you know, will this be enough? Um, depending on sea level rise and if we're ever going to do anything about it. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure if I know the answer. Um, you know, I think so far the consensus of um, uh, at least the, the managing agencies, the modelers uh, they've worked with is um, it's still worth it if we put them in the right locations. Uh, that's another reason I think why the lower diversions are not considered. Uh, they may not be able to 
you know, fight up against sea level rise and is there enough sediment still at that point to even really make a difference. But positioned right and in sh- and, and letting it out in shallow areas, the, you know, lower amounts of sediments are still uh, capable of, of, of uh, building wetlands. Okay, you almost uh, answered my second question with this, which was the question of not going ahead with the lower division uh, did your study have any impact on that? Well, I think it's contributed uh, that that's where, uh, you know, the, the, there's more shrimp there. Also, other species I didn't talk about and, and also where we don't have that much data about is uh, marine mammals. There's uh, dolphins in that area. Um, so I think um, the effect on fish and fisheries and, 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 and you know, general um, ecology did play a role uh, in, in that, that there would be uh, a bigger impact from those diversions. Uh, but, uh, yeah, a pretty high salinity area, fresh, just has a bigger shock to the system as well. And then with the knowledge that they weren't going to contribute much, uh, just maybe, uh, you know, these lower areas may be a lost cause at some point uh, with sea level rise uh, really together, uh, you know, resulted in those not being considered anymore. Thank you. And the uh, the numbers on sedimentation that really impressed me was something like uh, 400 million tons coming out in 1950 and by two, 2010, uh, 60 years later, it was down to 150 million ton. And uh, that, that loss of 250 million tons of sediment, I really found so funny on, during your previous president. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a totally different story. 250 million tons is a lot. And uh, one another thing that, that I found um, thought, what do you call the word for it? Oh, we Europeans came. The one, um, ah, I can't find the word for it. It's Carl telling me about how some of the good fishing places in this area was on former churchyards. And then you start to realize what kind of land loss there's been in this area when when there's so much water under these areas, uh, over these areas now, yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much, Kim. We should move on. Uh, we have a related presentation from Vasu Capucci. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, present as a guest lecturer. So my name is Vasu Carpuzzi. I guess the, my connection with uh, Billy goes back to 2001 uh, when I uh, came to Canada to study at UBC uh, at the Fishery Center. Uh, that's what it was called at that time. Um, uh, Vili was my professor. Um, I wasn't, he wasn't my supervisor, but he certainly influenced uh, my uh, studies and uh, later my, uh, my career and uh, often my thoughts these days to uh, go back to research. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, go back to school. Who knows? We'll see. Um, or maybe not, or just um, stick with the, the laid out course. Um, yeah, and later our paths crossed again uh, when uh, we uh, were called uh, by or uh, tasked, I guess, by the, the Port Authority, the Vancouver Phase of Port Authority to build a model uh, for a proposed uh, project uh, in the estuary uh, of uh, the Fraser River. And uh, I'm here today to talk to you about this um case study. Uh, maybe I don't want to call it a case study, but uh, definitely an example of where um, EWE uh, has been applied uh, to provide quantitative estimates of the magnitude of potential effects associated with a proposed project. So um, just to start by uh, giving a little bit of context uh, with respect to environmental assessment and the regulatory environment in um, Canada. Uh, so in August 2019, some of you may know, if not all of you, that environmental assessment legislation in Canada changed. 
Um, in this presentation, I will be referring to the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act 2012. Uh, I will also be calling it SIA 2012 at times for, for brevity, just for short. Uh, in August 2019, uh, SIA 2012 was replaced by the Impact Assessment Act. Notwithstanding uh, these changes, uh, the essence of environmental assessment in Canada remains the same. Uh, SIA 2012 and its regulations establish the legislative basis for the federal practice of environmental assessment in most regions of Canada. Under SIA 2012, environmental assessment is uh, defined as a process to predict environmental effects of proposed initiatives before they're carried out. So an environmental assessment identifies potential adverse effects associated with a proposed project, proposes measures to mitigate adverse effects, predicts whether there will be significant adverse effects after implementation of mitigation measures, and includes follow-up programs to evaluate these assessment predictions or the effectiveness of mitigation measures. So for the purposes of SIA 2012, environmental effects that need to be considered and assessed are in relation to uh, fish and fish habitat, um, among others. Uh, and fish and fish habitat is as defined by the Federal Fisheries Act. Uh, within the fish and fish habitat protection provisions, of, uh, there are two core prohibitions. One that prohibits the death of fish uh, with means other than fishing. And one that prohibits the harmful alteration disruption and destruction of fish habitat. One of the factors set out in the Fisheries Act that the minister must consider when making a, uh, a decision to issue an authorization related to the death of fish or the HAD, the harmful alteration, destruction and disruption of fish habitat, includes the consideration of the contribution to the productivity of relevant fisheries by the fish and fish habitat that are likely to be affected. For large scale impacts uh, that are likely to result in ecosystem uh, transformations, uh, most detailed estimates of impacts to productivity are usually required. And these likely involve uh, the use of quantitative fish population models. So regulatory policy and guidance also call for quantitative ecosystem-based approach to environmental assessment. <clears throat> this is often referred to as best practice for major projects that have the potential to result in ecosystem change. <clears throat> and despite this recommended best practice, historically, uh, environmental assessments have relied on largely single species models or mostly qualitative predictions <clears throat> and qualitative estimates of uncertainty. And given that they're qualitative, they're often difficult to test. Um, in this presentation, I will focus, as I said at the beginning, on the proposed Roberts Bank Terminal 2 project. This is a proposed project by the Port Authority in Vancouver, the, uh, which followed federal legislation and related policy targets with a focus on an ecosystem and productivity approach. Um, <clears throat> a bit of an overview, just brief overview of the project. The Roberts Bank Terminal 2 project, or RBT2 often called, is a proposed new three-berth marine terminal at Roberts Bank in Delta, BC. Uh, and it's uh, proposed to provide 2.4 million 20 foot equivalent units of additional container capacity on an annual basis. You see this uh, proposed project in red on this slide. The project is proposed to be constructed in the estuary of the Fraser River. Uh, and you may know the Fraser River is the largest salmon producing river in BC. The system also supports migrating populations of ulican. Uh, that's a forage fish, a smelt species, and also white sturgeon. 
Project components uh, include a marine terminal and a birth pocket uh, proposed to be constructed predominantly in the subtidal zone. Uh, also the widening of the existing causeway uh, that runs alongside um, yeah, what's there existing now, that provides access to the terminals that are there now, and also the expansion of the existing tech basin. And the project is undergoing a federal environmental assessment by independent review panel under SIA 2012. So as part of the requirements of the project's environmental assessment, the Port Authority submitted in 2015 an environmental impact statement. The guiding principles for developing, developing the, the impact statement were that the environmental assessment aligns with federal policy, is ecosystem and science-based, and manages uncertainty uh, in an effective manner. And it also uses multiple lines of evidence to draw assessment conclusions, and that it is transparent, collaboratively, collaborative, and interdisciplinary. To help meet these policy goals and objectives, the Port Authority convened a productive capacity technical advisory group. Mouthful, I'll be calling it advisory group from now on. Uh, participants included scientific representatives from government and academia, environmental consultants, and an independent facilitator. This advisory group was convened to solicit input on the methods that would be suitable for analyzing and reporting any changes to the ongoing productivity of the Roberts Bank ecosystem. As part of this process, the advisory group uh, shortlisted three methods, three modeling methods, uh, habitat suitability index methodology, uh, an index of biotic integrity or IBI, and also EWE. These three methods uh, were screened further using criteria that were standardized and uh, the methods were then scored. Uh, EWE ranked first, uh, and the reasons for that was that it was applicable to the Roberts Bank ecosystem. It was scientifically defensible. It was able to describe net change in productivity and identify key trade-offs. Uh, it was able to incorporate an assessment of uncertainty applicable to evaluating mitigation and down the road offsetting. And also it was deemed robust to regulatory changes. One of the key outcomes of the advisory group was that it identified focal species. The group defined those as those species that are ecologically linked to many components of the ecosystem uh, and are able to provide an indication of change in the productive capacity of a broader number of species. You see these focal species on the slide, they're grouped under five uh, major um, categories or groups, larger groups. Uh, there are six focal species of marine vegetation, four of marine invertebrates, seven of marine fish, two of marine mammals, and six of coastal birds. As I mentioned, another key outcome is, uh, was the unanimous selection of EWE as the preferred modeling method to analyze the changes as a result of the project in the ongoing productivity of the Roberts Bank ecosystem. <clears throat> so the, the next steps following uh, the uh, technical advisory group process uh, was uh, the development of the Roberts Pine ecosystem model using EWE. <clears throat> the Port Authority um, tasked uh, technical experts from UBC, uh, Vili specifically, and his team, as well as experts from ESSA technologies that have used um, EWE within the context of environmental assessment, as well as uh, technical uh, consultants from Himera. 
<coughs> and built the model. Inputs for the model included primarily local data collected during field studies, and these were undertaken uh, over several years uh, spanning from 2011 uh, to more recently in 2019. Uh, information from the literature was also collected, also information from other EW models for the Strait of Georgia, especially when local data, empirical data, uh, were not available. The model incorporated uh, the results of uh, coastal geomorphic modeling, uh, which was also rooted in local data. In the next slide, I will explain a little bit further uh, what aspects of the coastal geomorphic model we were interested in and we ended up using. So in essence, we were trying to see how changes with the project of coastal geomorphic conditions or abiotic conditions would affect the productive capacity or the biotic components of the Roberts Bank ecosystem. We also evaluated uncertainty in input parameters using multiple sensitivity analyses. Uh, the Port Authority also hired an independent third party to review the model's inputs, the process, and the results. So the RB model that was built for the EIS in 2014 was later transferred to a newer version of EWE. This transfer happened in the early 2020. And at that time, we also took the opportunity to update the model and incorporate this new empirical information that we collected in the field in 2019. Uh, at that time, we also decided to introduce in the model multi-stanza groups to respond to comments made by Fisheries and Oceans Canada during their initial science review of the model. So the updated RB model or the Robert Span ecosystem model comprised 64 functional groups. Dungeness crab, chum, and Chinook salmon were broken into multi-stanza groups and based on the differences in their life history stages. The ecosystem model used ecospace to evaluate the changes in the productive capacity of the Roberts Bank ecosystem. It was run under two different scenarios. The first one without the project to reflect in a way existing conditions or conditions that would establish should the, the project not go ahead. And with the project to examine potential project impacts. It assessed both direct footprint effects as well as indirect effects due to changes in coastal geomorphology, <clears throat> habitat suitability and predator prey dynamics. Wherever feasible, we were able to compare the model's representation of existing conditions to field measurements uh, and determine whether the model accurately reproduced existing conditions. For uh, This worked very well for habitat forming groups, and by that I mean vegetative habitats. And an example would be native eelgrass. The graphic that you see on the slide demonstrates how the ecosystem model was created for Roberts Bank. So as a first step, information for each of the 64 functional groups was compiled. These 64 functional groups include the 25 focal species that I mentioned earlier, identified by the advisory group. Information uh, was uh, provided as input into the model on biomass, production, consumption, and of course, diet. And this was used to construct the static mass balanced food web using Ecopath. Second step, the information on the abiotic factors from the coastal geomorphological model uh, were incorporated. Uh, those that, uh, the factors that we used included salinity, depth, velocity, and wave height. Uh, the environmental preference of each functional group for each of these abiotic factors was established as a way of predicting why species are where they are currently. Uh, and uh, it, it sort of ex expresses habitat preference. Uh, and uh, this information informed the food web that was recreated over space. Third step, uh, it was the introduction of a time component. 
Uh, the ecosystem model was run over time until a stable state was reached. So that took approximately 10 years. And lastly, the simulation was run, like I said, without and with the project. And that yielded a change in productivity. We used two metrics, proxy metrics of productivity, biomass and production. So on the left of this slide, you see outputs of the coastal geomorphic modeling exercise for salinity, current, wave height, and depth. I should have mentioned earlier, we use the fifth um, layer uh, in the habitat preference uh, section of the model, and that was not dependent on the coastal geomorphology model, and that was the hard soft layer, we call it. It's just the um, affinity or affiliation of species or groups with either a hard a substrate or soft substrate, and that was created independently. Uh, where the map distribution ex existed, such as, uh, for example, for marine vegetative habitats, we could sample each abiotic map. And the environmental preference of each functional group for each of these abiotic factors was established, like I said, as a way of predicting why the species are where they are currently. And so the assumption was that the frequency of occurrence equals habitat preference. Um, we also used literature to inform the preference curves uh, that were generated. You see those on the right of on this slide. And smoothing was done uh, where it was needed to fill any gaps in the distribution in the curve uh, to make it ecologically realistic. Um, this is an example of the outputs of EcoSpace. Um, uh, these are generated for each functional group. I'm just showing here uh, the example of adult Dungeness crab. On the left, the productivity of adult Dungeness crab is shown without the project. Uh, in the middle, uh, the productivity of crab is shown with the project. And the output is the impact with the project shown on the right, where you see the difference in productivity. Uh, uh, in this case, it's with minus without the project. The histogram that you see on the slide shows the net change in the productivity uh, because of RBT2 for all the functional groups. And uh, of course, the extremes, uh, either the, the largest net loss or the largest net increase. So their ratio is calculated by looking at the productivity with the project over time and space over the productivity without the project over time and space again. Um, I looked at this, uh, the, this histogram in, in the morning and realized that the numbers were a bit off. So I did put it together in some haste, but regardless, the, the, the frequency looks exactly like that um, uh, with uh, some, um, it's not 58, I think it's a smaller number of groups, but um, still quite high. So for the most part, for most of the functional groups in the model, the biomass ratio, so the change, the impact is really, really small, um, close to uh, 1% or close to between 0 and 1%. Uh, and then uh, for um, some groups, uh, we um, noted a decline, a loss in productivity with a project that's within uh, the 5% margin. Uh, and we um, chose 5% uh, as a margin uh, because uh, we determined that this was close enough to the error margin of the, of the model. Uh, on the, the positive side of things, you see a similar trend where um, a few functional groups change within that 5% range between 0 and 5%. And uh, at the extreme ends, um, orange sea pens decline by um, a good 55%. That has to do with the distribution of orange sea pens. Uh, there's currently an aggregation that's located exactly where the marine terminal footprint is proposed. So that reflects a footprint effect. On the flip side, uh, there's a... Uh, over 80%, I think it's about 83%, if I remember correctly, of an increase in tidal marsh 
uh, along the shoreline of Roberts Bank, north of the causeway predominantly. And that has to do with uh, the changes predicted uh, in coastal geomorphology. So conditions with the project change in a way that these areas become more conducive to growth of tidal marsh. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sensitivity analysis uh, and how it was managed, uh, how it helped, I should say, manage uncertainty uh, in input parameters. So sensitivity analysis were done uh, when um, the Roberts Bank ecosystem model uh, was first developed in 2014, as well as after the transfer to a newer EWE professional version in 2020. Uh, just to use an analogy here, uh, the different inputs and outputs of the model are like the, the levers on a machine. We pulled and pushed on the different levers uh, to see how the model would react. But overall, the, the sensitivity analysis results showed that these outputs would not really change significantly. And the determination that was overall, the model was robust. Um, the different uh, sensitivity analyses were undertaken. One looked at the biotic factors uh, by varying predator vulnerability setting. Uh, that, um, ver that We changed that over a range of values between 1 and 10. I believe we used five different values. And um, lower values in the sensitivity of the vulnerability setting equate to uh, bottom-up effects, whereas higher values equate to top-down effects. Um, we looked at how the biomass ratio, like I said, the with over the without the project changed as we altered these vulnerability settings. And the larger overall the changes in the biomass ratio showed that uh, the outputs were uh, more sensitive to biotic factors. Another uh, type of sensitivity analysis was uh, removing the abiotic factors one at a time. Uh, so we did five different scenarios, uh, given the five different uh, abiotic um, factors that we looked at. And for the with project scenario, the model was rerun several times, omitting one abiotic factor at a time. And the biomass ratio was compared between the key run and the run omitting each factor. We identified, as a result, the abiotic factors that resulted in the largest positive and negative biomass ratios as a result of this exercise. Uh, we also did Monte Carlo analyses. Uh, by uh, considering the joint variation of biomass, the P over B, the Q over B, um, yeah, those three, I believe, in both uh, cases in 2014 and 2020. Uh, the assumptions, um, uh, so th these parameters were varied using the pedigree uh, of the model. Uh, and uh, the outputs showed the robustness of the model. The needle didn't move all that much uh, for many of the groups. The Monte Carlo analysis was the only type of sensitivity analysis that was undertaken in 2020. The reason for that was time, really. Just um, we didn't have the time we um, wanted to, to maybe look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, in this, on this slide, I am going to spend a little bit of time explaining how the quantitative outputs of the model were used within that environmental assessment framework and how they were integrated. So as I said, the, the model was one of several tools that was used to inform the environmental assessment uh, and the conclusions were based on multiple lines of evidence. These are shown here in the blue boxes, modeling included EWE, but we also did uh, built other models, uh, for example, <clears throat> habitat suitability for Pacific sandlands, uh, a Bayesian population model was created for Dungeness crab, and there were other models. Um, 
Field studies were also looked at, uh, studies on abundance, distribution, and use of rubbered spanning habitats by marine fish and invertebrates. Uh, a number uh, that was that I saw um, a few months ago, or maybe over a year ago now, that we spent 30, over 35,000 hours in the field uh, gathering local data. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, this, this number is so out of date because uh, we spent yet another year out there uh, logging multiple hours. So that we also looked at scientific literature and conclusions of other environmental assessments for projects nearby, and also uh, consider indigenous knowledge um, throughout the consultation that's been happening for, for years now. And so to integrate multiple lines of evidence, the outputs of the model and the sensitivity analysis were used as a quantitative reference point to begin evaluating these potential effects. And by that, I mean that the outputs helped us understand the direction, uh, be it negative or positive, and the relative magnitude of the effects uh, for each of the species. Other lines of evidence were used to evaluate effects from mechanisms that were not captured by EWE. Some examples uh, were underwater noise or light uh, during project construction activities. Uh, expert opinion was uh, relied on to draw conclusions on productivity changes by integrating both quantitative and qualitative information from different lines of evidence. And we used a uh, common classification system um, and different categories, negligible, minor, moderate, and high. And these are based on um, percentages, ranges. I'll show you an example right here on the next slide to explain this a little bit more. So what you see on this table uh, are the, the lines of evidence on the left. In the middle, the tools that informed each line of evidence. And then on the right, the third column, the conclusion uh, supported by each line of evidence. And each conclusion per uh, tool and per line of evidence was given, was ranked based on this classification system. And it was given, it was put into a bucket, a negligible minor, moderate, or high, depending on the percentage change that was predicted. So negligible was considered anything that changes within that 5% error margin minor uh, between six and 30%, moderate between 31 and 60%, and high anything above 61%. Um, so the RB model went through a lot of scrutiny. Um, it was in review for almost three years, and I have highlighted here some of the review phases. Uh, DFO Science conducted a technical review of the model and its application to RBT2, and especially the environmental assessment. And DFO made a number of comments. Some were favor favorable, some were not so much. But DFO commented that the, the model is very complex, uh, with some reservations about its use to study a relatively small and open system like Robert's Van. Uh, seasonality in species uh, is not well captured. And an example that was given was that juvenile salmon for, are present in the estuary for only a couple of months, and using an annualized average may not necessarily be representative of the time juvenile salmon rear in the estuary. On the flip side, uh, some species groups and abiotic variables that were chosen describe the ecosystem appropriately. And, you know, after we take into account all these negative and positive considerations, the model does the best job possible of comparing the biomass and productivity of the ecosystem with and without the project. So during completeness and sufficiency review of the EIS, we responded to numerous information requests for the model. Uh, there was an entire package of information requests by the review panel that was dedicated to EWE. And additional sensitivity analysis was done to evaluate the robustness of model outputs, and as well as to respond to these questions on model validation, vulnerability, and dispersal rates. The review of the model culminated with a public hearing in spring 2019. At the hearing, the, the model was discussed at a dedicated session in uh, May 2019. 
Overall, implementation in environmental assessment of VWE, and in particular Ecospace, is unprecedented in Canada. Uh, it has raised the bar and it has enabled the quantification of both direct and indirect effects. And it provided rigorous documentation of uncertainty, uh, which was associated with such predictions. Just summarizing a few key points. The, the Roberts Bank ecosystem model provided quantitative estimates of changes in productivity, including uncertainty in those estimates. It was determined to be robust to uncertainty in input parameters and also provided one of several lines of evidence that were considered in the environmental assessment for this project. We're nearing the end of the project's panel review phase. Uh, in the meantime, we have taken the RB model to the next level as uh, we enter the project's permitting phase. And as I said, we're adding to our field hours and undertaking additional field work to gather information on marine resources at Roberts Bank. We took advantage of the transition to a newer professional version to update the model and incorporate all this new information that has been collected. We also tried to stretch the model a little bit and uh, we uh, quantified effects predicted from project construction, specifically from underwater noise uh, during impact piling proposed for project construction, as well as uh, behavioral disturbance of some species. Uh, we developed some habitat-based models, uh, which are subsets of the larger uh, ecosystem model to estimate productivity gains using ecopath from habitats proposed to be built as part of the project's offsetting requirements. We also developed an individual-based model uh, and investigated the project's impact on movements of Chinook salmon when they exit the river mouth and swim to areas south of the causeway uh, in order to rear to grow. Um, and as part of the project's follow-up program, and after input from the regulators and stakeholders, uh, there are four follow-up program elements that have been committed to by the Port Authority to evaluate these, uh, the forecasts of the ecosystem model. These are specific to, uh, these follow-up program elements are specific to marine vegetation, uh, in fauna, uh, macrofauna and myofauna specifically, rockfish and lingcod, and great blue heron. And as we enter the next phase of the project, uh, we are at the onset of developing these uh, follow-up program uh, elements in greater detail. Uh, I, this concludes my presentation, uh, and I'll open the floor to questions. There are, there are a number of interesting aspects uh, to this and uh, um, this project here that I gave an overview of, and I want to mention the long uh, review process with DFO and the comment from DFO about the model not being complex and not appropriate for small open systems um, really is a misunderstanding from DFO, the people involved there, which we were not able over several years to get into their heads. It relates quite much to quite a lot to something we talked about here in, in this course about always be specific about the question that you're developing, developing the model to ask. Well, I don't know if I expressed that the right way, but you know what the question is because we've been through it many times. You have to be specific about your question. The question that was asked here by the technical advisory group when we started was, how will this project impact productivity in that area? So that's the question we set out to answer. And we did that by focusing on this. So it doesn't matter that it's an open system. We are focusing on productivity, habitat productivity, and how that's channeled up to the food web. It doesn't matter that killer whales come and go. The model says this little piece of land, water, how is that going to be, how is the productivity of that going to be opened? So we're not trying to predict what happens to herring in the strait. We're trying to uh, predict how is the productivity in that those one hectare 
grid cells, how is that going to be impacted? And that is the right model to use for that question. Um, that was, yeah, that we couldn't get through. Um, another aspect of this, and this is goes for both the, the uh, what Kim has been talking about and what Ross has been talking about, is that not just do these projects move science and environmental impact assessments ahead, uh, but there's also kind of a, a, a a spin-off which is a need for, for the ecosystem model aspect of it. And that's develop, further development of the modeling complex that we benefit from. Uh, from Kim, it's related to, for instance, the uh, much more stringent use of the temporal spatial framework and also the model development for, for the oysters. For Robert's bank, uh, one aspect of this was we had to create a spin-up module. The Vaso referred to it that it took 10 years for it to stabilize. So we have a we have a, a plug-in there that fits in and that where you can just run Aerospace for 10 years, get it to stabilize, and then start your run again from there. The first 10 years, it's just like Groundhog Day. It just keeps repeating itself for 10 for 10 years. And then we start the actual application after that. Another thing in what uh, Vaso talked about in this project here related to was that we developed a Monte Carlo routine for spatial analysis, uh, which is now a part of it. So um, that's some kind, kind of really neat spin-offs. Before we go to the questions there, uh, I would, uh, from, from from all of you, the uh, I think it would be good if we just took the uh, two introductions and then we go to the questions. And uh, we have two, we have one from Spencer, which is uh, about the uh, EA process in Canada and uh, a second one from Aaron about uh, the uh, river pr uh, projects down in, in the Amazon. And uh, I'll hand it over to Spencer, who happens to working, be working for the Waste Vancouver Fraser Port Authority and uh, has, uh, is in a good position to give uh, this introduction. Spencer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Vili. Um Yeah, thank you, um, Vasiliki. Uh, I don't think we've met but uh, I've heard of your work. Um, so uh, I won't be going into a lot of detail because there's so much that, that you can talk about, but um, what I will show is uh, kind of the process of how um, anybody here can learn more about the process that RBT2 went through. So I'm gonna share my screen. So um, <clears throat> in the readings, I have I got this this nice indication of Go to this huge website and and, and look for a look look through it to find EcoPath. And what you find is um, when you go to the Impact Assessment Agency website. So this is the overseeing um, organization that has uh, the regulations that are, act as an umbrella for all federally regulated projects. And um, anybody can go to this mandated registry for all federally um, overseen projects. So anybody can go to this website and look through the impact assessment registry to find different projects. And in particular, today we looked at RBT2, or sorry, Roberts Bank Terminal 2, which is, is known as RBT2 um, uh, within the Port Authority. So some really key documents that I'm actually going to share, and I realize I can't is there a way for me to share um, documents in the chat while I'm still presenting? Not really, huh? Oh, share them in. Hmm. You can copy it down there, just to. Copy it. Or you can uh, share it via and... Slack. You can Slack. do that. Well, yeah, I want to share yeah. it live, live, but okay. Just, I'll... just copy, copy that and put it down in the, in the chat. Okay, but I think I have to, oh, here we go. There we go. So, oops. so this this document, um, if you go to uh, Appendix 10B, it has the entire um, really detailed uh, evaluate or um, really detailed methods and results for every functional group. There's about 250 pages um, that you can go through if you want to find more details about how um, the Port Authority and Hemera did their did their um, did the used ecopath? And it was in a lot of detail. So I'll show some examples. For instance, on page 34, 
um, they, you can see all the different functional groups that were involved. And by the way, I'm pretty sure that this document <laughs> is quite out of date already, but this was the impact assessment uh, statement. So it's already six years out of date and um, um, the team has already updated this, but this is, this is one of the documents you can find. Go through all the details. So this shows all the different functional groups. And if you wanna see um, the actual um, uh, Ecopath um, representation, here are all of the different functional groups and how they work as, um, as a food web. And so we're already at 200, at page 234. So there's a lot of detail in between that, obviously. And then you can find a spatial boundary here. And then they go into more and more detail. So you'll find quite, you know, quickly that there's a lot of detail here. So if you have any really specific questions, they're, they're in this document. But um, this is the impact assessment statement. And um, here's the actual assessment that was provided by the federal re review panel. So for really complex projects like Robert Banks Thermal 2, a third party review panel is chosen to, re to, to actually look at it. And they look at every different aspect of, of um, of the project. And when it comes to Ecopath, if we go to page, um, what page is that? 3.2.2. Uh, I won't take too much more time, but um, as Willie was talking about earlier, um, the, the, the review panel brought up some of their concerns with um, using um, a complex, where, sorry, let me go here. Um, they bring up some of the concerns with using a complex project for, uh, sorry, a, com a complex model for such a small um, spatial area. Um, and you can kind of go through how they do their assessment. And that can all be found in this document here, which I'm also gonna post. And what I like most is, um, I'm gonna go to DFO's assessment and there's a lot of different documents and you can I'm posting them all here in case anyone wants to look into more detail. But um, um, first order, one second. Okay, so even though they had all these concerns with um, you know the small and open area versus the complexity of the of the of the model, um, there is an agreement that um, the EWE model uh, is very useful for first order frameworks to organize information and derive estimates generally. Um, and that's the most that they could get out of the regulators uh, for this. For 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 this, but um, there's so much detail that, that went into this, and um, I really invite people to kind of read a little bit more into it. But what I'd like to say um, ultimately is that this is a really um, being an impact assessment reviewer myself for smaller projects. Um, there is uh, a difficulty in um, doing an ecosystem management approach for projects. Often it's focused on really key um, species at risk or um, really key components. But with uh, eco, with um, EWE, with Ecospace, it actually it provides a really important tool to use um, to look at an entire ecosystem instead of focusing on very key species, which is, which is quite rare, which is why it's on the cutting edge. And I really hope they get to use more often in um, not just major projects, but lots of different projects, particularly when you when you look at um, uh, cumulative impacts of lots of small projects that might um, that might otherwise go un unnoticed. So that's those, those are my my two pieces. Great, thank you very much, Spencer. Do you, Marion, do you uh, want to just mention the Amazona project? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I can. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm just briefly going to talk about, um, give a brief introduction on this paper called Fisheries and Trophic Structure of a Large Tropical River um, Under Impoundment. Okay. And um, so the point of this study was to model the def uh, effects of a dam that um, was built near um, the Amazon River. And the reason why this is so important is because within the last decade, a very few number of dams have been built. Um, but there's a, a plan to have um, over 200 dams built in the area overall. 
So they looked at uh, two dams that have been built not too long ago. And uh, this could give an idea of, well, there, there are two important factors. So one, um, this might be the first study that actually, actually looks at modeling um, the effects of the dam, looking at um, the area before the dam and after the dam is built uh, through Ecopath. And uh, secondly, knowing um, you know how the ecosystem has changed from uh, the building of these two dams could uh, help um, with management in the future. So um, one reason why looking at the dams is so important is because hydrology is a key driver to the ecosystem. So it affects things like uh, the life history of the of the fish there. It affects community structure and whatnot. And so they used EcoPath to model um, these rivers, uh, these ecosystems before the building of the dam. They had um, data on that. And then after the, the building of the dam, and then used EcoSim for the temporal component. And what they found was, and this is the, the figure that I chose um, from this paper, but they did find some differences. And you can see here that um, the consumption, and so this is pre, this column is the pre-values and the post-values, and the consumption and um, the respiration has increased dramatically after uh, the building of the dam. And then on the other hand, when you look at the biomass, and this was probably one of the biggest findings of this paper, the biomass was, was half uh, after the dam uh, was built. So it's a significant study because uh, um, it's one of the first to model what using EcoPath before and after uh, a, dam, a, a dam has been built. And that's pretty much all I have for you today. Oh, thank you very much, Mariam. And that means we can we can move on now to uh, um, questions. And Sylvia, you uh, want to start off? Uh, yeah, um, thanks for this presentation. Um, I have a question. So um, the underwater noise was uh, quantified during construction and uh, I guess the effects were looked at, but was actually noise changing the environment after the terminal was already in place because there's going to be a lot of ships coming in and going. Uh, I mean, there's, I think it was three new terminals that are being added. So that's quite a lot of more traffic. Um, substantially is going to increase the noise in the environment. And we know that there's quite a lot of effects, different types of effects actually on fish species and marine mammals. Uh, that incorporated into the ecospace model. And if so, what were the effects? Because I don't think I could anything about that. Yeah, th thank you for this question. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's uh, underwater noise effects uh, during construction that are predicted during construction and also uh, effects that um, come with um, uh, traffic ship ships um, approaching berthing at the terminal. Um, yes, uh, there was... Um, noise modeling that was done, noise propagation modeling, not using AWE. There's a different um, a company, uh, JASCO. Uh, you, you may uh, have heard of them. Uh, they use their own uh, proprietary model to um, look at noise propagation. Uh, and in this case, they've looked at, um, for RB2 specifically, they looked at um, a large number of scenarios. Um, I wanna say about 24. Uh, I may be um, incorrect with that number, but it's it's similar to that. It's definitely over 20 scenarios. And um, they looked at both construction as well as the operation phase of the project. So after it's built uh, the operation uh, with respect to birthing of ships, the movement of tugs and so on. So these scenarios provided uh, results with respect to how far the noise may travel. Um, and this is in relation to specific thresholds or criteria that are set by DFO uh, as a regulatory requirement. And the requirement is to essentially keep noise below <clears throat> these thresholds um, for construction. There's two thresholds. One looks at injury or mortality, fish fish kills. In effect, when the noise is really loud and uh, short and um, impulsive, um, 
And the, the other threshold is, is not legislated or um, required, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's a recommendation um, that's coming from DFO. Uh, and it looks at sort of the behavioral disturbance for noises that are not as loud or sharp, uh, but they're continuous and um, sort of a lower hum that can um, drive fish away. So these two thresholds were used for construction and the behavioral threshold was also looked at uh, for operation, for the operation phase. Um, What that modeling showed us was that the behavioral disturbance during the operation phase, during ships birthing and unbirthing, was similar, or actually the results were the same as the um, as during construction uh, construction activities that produce that similar noise. So when you have, for example, transiting of construction vessels, tugs, or when you dredge, um, as opposed to piling of uh, driving of piles. And so what we did was we took the the scenarios that one scenario for impact noise for the really loud noise that would uh, lead to fish kills. And we also looked at a scenario that does, that looks at behavioral disturbance from production from, uh, sorry, from continuous noise. And so we looked at these two different scenarios together to see how much per activity may be lost from these two different types of, of noise. So in effect, Birthing and unbirthing of ships is looked at using a proxy scenario of um, a continuous continuous noise uh, that was modeled for construction. So it's taken into account um, under uh, that continuous noise scenario. And the two scenarios were modeled differently in echo space. So the noise was done with mediation and the... Um, for the uh, construction noise, the, the piling, uh, we used uh, impact on uh, other mortality. We in, in, used an other mortality factor. The work, uh, some work that uh, Dave Jagaris and uh, Jerome has been doing on how we incorporate lethal noise into EWE, so we could directly read that in and, and let it uh, let it see what how, how a big mortality effect that came from that so those analyses were done in echo space here great um sorry, emma i think this covers up. your question yeah, yeah you follow up question. Question, sorry. Uh, we only have five minutes left so i i do okay, want to get uh, a couple more questions in yeah, no spencer worries. you had you had something about offsetting yeah i have a quick question so uh, there's obviously the the ewe which was safe models used for um uh adverse impacts uh, from the project. Um, but what about in choosing best offsetting options? Has that ever kind of been a thought? I haven't been exposed to the project that much internally. So I'm kind of wondering, is it, do you think it's something that could also be used to determine what the best offsetting options might be instead of what might have traditionally been chosen, which is like, um, they, they, use, they use other tools to make those decisions. So what do you think about EWE with Ecospace as a tool for that? Yeah, and I, I'm not sure I understand, you know, the question of choosing, using EWE to choose the best offsets. Um, so let me answer it this way. Um, the offsets were chosen based on our understanding of the system and the types of species that are there and the types of habitats that they're using currently. So the objective is to offset the losses and to offset the losses, you need to provide those habitats that are used currently to increase the productivity by providing this food and refuge. So to do this, um, selection of habitats habitats were chosen uh, that would fit in the the system that we're working with. So there's proposals to build uh, tidal marsh and there's proposals to build, to transplant native eelgrass. And so having that as a starting point, we used EWE to determine how much productivity would these constructed habitats will give us once they have established. And so that was done using two different methods. 
one method Vili is probably more um, capable of explaining. I wasn't involved in that process, so I'll be I'll do a terrible job explaining. In effect, it just picks the cells that. Um, yeah, see, uh, I'll maybe stop here and let Billy explain. But I can talk about the second option, which uh, uses ecopath to form food webs for native eelgrass, say, one food web and the species that it supports, and run that to produce an equilibrium and use those values to determine what the productivity is expected or is predicted to be associated with that constructed habitat and use that to understand how much we will gain if we were to build I don't know, 10 hectares, 20 hectares of native eel grass. So we, we, we use DW that way. Um, yeah, Billy. <laughs> no, I don't really want to add the details. Okay. The main thing is it, it was challenging. Uh, it was a long, long negotiation with DFO. And uh, we tried to find the best reasonable, reasonable and good ways of doing it. But it was, it was a very long and tedious process. So uh, let me uh, thank uh, our two speakers. Uh, it's been really interesting to see how much development has been on using ecosystem modeling as part of the environmental impact assessment process. And uh, this is, I'm convinced, an area where we will see a lot of applications in the future. As Vaso especially pointed out, the uh, implication of using ecosystem analysis and not just look at it piecemeal for what, what the impact of such projects is, is important. And ecosystem modeling definitely has um, a big contribution to make. And the progress we've seen in recent years on spatial modeling uh, related to both the temporal spatial framework but and uh, to coupling or linking to other model types uh, provides a very solid foundation for how this work can be used for environmental impact assessment. So uh, be, this will be interesting to be able to see what happens there. Thank you very much all. Uh, see you next time. <laughs>